know me, and I like that only some of you know me, and I don't know a lot of other faces. I'm Julianne Schicker. I'm the assistant professor of German here at Carleton. My colleague is right in front of me, Josiah is here. Um, we are one third of the German department. Our last third is in Berlin right now, Ziggy Leona. She's leading the abroad program, uh, 17 students, I believe. They're having a lot of fun. Um, but I'm very happy to see you all here today. What is the last event of our German Campus Weeks series sponsored by the German Embassy? And um, I cannot be happier to have actually someone from this entity here tonight. Um, so today, some of you, many of you may know, November 9th, a very fateful day in German history, um, one of the most trying um, possibly in German history, it is a, a good day to talk about relations between countries, between cultures, between people, and that's what we want to do today. Talk, discuss, hear, listen um, to all of these things. Um, before our language associate Kim over here will introduce Council General Quelle, um, I would like to thank all the involved parties that made this possible. Um, the German Weeks were a series of four events. We had a business summit um, in the, as the first event where representatives of Minnesota companies that had something to do with German uh, came to campus. It was super interesting to hear their perspective on language studies and on career choices. And then um, we went on a field trip to Siemens here in Minnetonka and learned more on site. Um, and it was always um, a collective endeavor with the St. Olaf side of German. So our colleagues on that part of town were also uh, involved. And their students were also on the field trip. And hope that some of them, and I know some of them are here. Uh, and the third event uh, was an alumni summit where we had three people from different businesses or three different business sides um, talk to us about what did I do with this German major, German minor, just German studies in my life? What am I doing right now? Where am I going? So I am very happy that we had these three, with, three events and uh, now the fourth one today. Our thanks go to many, many entities. First of all, of course, the German embassy for their inspiration and for the financial support. And um, some German swag is over there. I heard someone say that earlier. <laughs> uh, for you to, uh, to take away some Germany from here, some backpacks and t-shirts and notepads. So that you always remember, this is the German side of things. And there, that's awesome. Um, then Kim Betts from the Carleton College Career Center. She brought us in contact with our alumni. Uh, she actually had her students produce this flyer in uh, various iterations. Um, and then also the staff at the St. Olaf Kreiser Center for Vocation and Career were also part of this connecting people. Then uh, we thank the German American Institute in St. Paul for advertising and for helping us uh, get some other connections going that we needed. Um, the German American Chambers <coughs> of Commerce um, they have a flyer actually over there. If you want to get involved as a student, there's one year free. You don't have to pay any fees. So they helped us with our business summit and the field trip. Um, of course, my colleagues here at Carlton and over the hill, Karen, where are you? I see you somewhere. Right here. Um, and uh, our Carlton president uh, and our dean, who are supportive of not only German but of the languages. Yeah, if you want to learn more about us, we have a Facebook and an Instagram and sometimes a Twitter, and we are also people, um, so connect with us. But without further ado, Kim, you are here to introduce our Okay, right, so, hello and herzlich willkommen von meiner Seite. No worries, I won't go on speaking in German, so hello and welcome from my side. I'm glad to welcome so many people to our last event of German Campus Week. I'm honored to welcome Consul General Herbert Quelle from the German Consulate of Chicago. Welcome to Carl. So, I'm happy to give the introduction to this event because this is a special event for me personally because as a Bachelor of Political Science and German and for sure as being here as a German at Carl, which is also kind of a bilateral relation, can we say that? Yeah, um, this is really important to me and it's more than and I'm more than interested to learn about bilateral relations between Germany and the USA from an expert. So some days ago when I checked some information about Consul General Quella, I saw that he nearly studied the same things as I did, except from one subject. He studied English political science and musicology, whereas I studied English political science and German. 
And when I started studying this subject, my dad looked at me, shaked his head, and said, well, English, political science, and German, what are you going to work with that when you don't want to be a teacher? You want to be a taxi driver? And I was like, well, now I will tell you that that there is still hope to become something great or even the next consul general of that city, <laughs> that he knows now. <laughs> so, yeah, some facts about consul general Quellet. He was born 1953 in Herford, which is in the northwestern part of Germany. And after his studies in 1980, he joined the German Foreign Service and has had a lot of assignments abroad so far. His CV is impressive and his job as a diplomat has brought him to a lot of different places in the world including Europe, South Africa, Baku, which is in Azerbaijan, Havana, different places in the United States, and of course Germany. Since 2014, he is the Consul General in Chicago. He does not only know a lot about political bilateral relations between the US and Germany, but also about musical relations between those two countries. His book, Monica Blues, which I saw right here, um, Monika's Blues talks about the connection between the German Mundharmonika, an instrument, a German instrument, and the Afro-American blues culture. Also, Council General Quelle himself plays, if I'm right, in form the guitar, the piano, for sure the harmonica, and he is also a singer. And I've heard that he had a small gig at Rocky Bottoms River Pub earlier this year here in Northfield. <laughs> so, yeah. Good, so enough talking from my side so far. Consul General Quella, I'm really happy to welcome you here at Carlton. And again, thank you all for coming around. I'm excited about our talk, and so I will leave the floor now to Consul General. Thank you. Thank you. Kim, has, Kim has used the microphone, but maybe I should I use it? Yes. Maybe it's, it's, it's better. Yeah, that's good. Then I need a piano so much. Yeah, um, anybody recognize uh, the uh, music you heard in the beginning? Yeah. How did you like that version? That's... <laughs> yeah, uh, it was produced in Chicago by a good friend of mine and the guy playing harmonica on it is me. And uh, we're probably going to use it in the Deutschlandjahr, uh, the year about Germany which is about to start uh, next year. Year, next uh, day of unity on the 3rd of uh, October uh, and we'll run from which is our national day 3rd of October day of German unity to uh, the American uh, national day which is Independence Day 4th of July uh, promoting Germany uh, in this country we've done that uh, in quite a few uh, countries in the past, but never in a highly industrialized country like the United States. So it's a it's a first, but we just feel that, or it will be a first. Uh, we just feel that um, the historic uh, um, relationship between uh, Europe, in particular Germany and and uh, the United States, is uh, this perspective is being lost um, in the rhetoric uh, that we've heard uh, from Washington for the uh, past uh, 12 months. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, we, we like to emphasize the uh, importance that uh, German immigration has played to uh, building this uh, country. And we like to uh, stress uh, the uh, forms of cooperation that exist in many ways, uh, not only by uh, you Americans having uh, imported in such large numbers the harmonica, mm -hmm. which many Americans do not know that it's not an instrument produced in the south of the United States. Okay. Uh, it has almost exclusively been produced in German-speaking uh, lands and came to market in 18 in the 1920s in Vienna, and was uh, then produced in large uh, numbers in uh, places near the Black Forest and in, in Saxony, and hundreds, some hundred millions have entered the United States since the 1860s, which uh, coincides with the emancipation <coughs> movement of uh, African Americans after the Civil War, of course, and then the instrument plays a huge role in blues. It's uh, the third most important uh, instrument after voice 
and uh, guitar. Uh, and um, uh, so I, I would argue um, that um, without the blues, the harmonica would have lost its uh, would have lost its uh, attraction um, because for folk music, its purpose had been fulfilled with. Uh, folk music sort of dying also in Germany, and without the uh, harmonica, uh, the blues would not have been able to uh, 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 come to where it is today, still. Uh, it's a niche uh, uh, in uh, the different genres, admittedly, but it is uh, a quite well-visited uh, niche if you go to uh, some uh, blues clubs in uh, Chicago. Uh, for uh, for instance, and people who are uh, more interested in that subject, yes, you have an, you have an option to uh, uh, look at my book, which is an easy read with a lot of information, but it's a fictional story about somebody traveling from uh, Chicago to the Mississippi Delta uh, on the trail of uh, the blues. And I have a, a few copies here, so anybody interested, please approach me after uh, the lecture. Um, why do I think it is important to um, talk about the harmonica? Because one of the issues that we are confronted with these days, and which seem to be a little more controversial between the United States and Germany's protectionism in uh, uh, commercial economic uh, relations. And uh, uh, the uh, harmonica is, uh, is a good example in a way, and it's not a typical example at all in, in, in another respect. Um, if the harmonica had not been able to enter the United States in such lum num large numbers, all the opportunities that are just outlined for uh, different musical genres uh, being able to develop themselves and players getting opportunities for, uh, um, for, uh, for jobs, all this would not have happened if there had been higher tariffs on the import of the instrument. And you would also not have protected your own industry because Americans tried for some time here and there, various places in the country, to build the harmonica themselves. It's not actually that difficult. But then it never uh, was successful. So the only way how you could meet your demand was importing it. And only since the 1930s has there been a production from in Japan, for instance, and instruments from Japan have also come to the United States. But the main uh, product has been uh, that from from Germany. Uh, and uh, so, whenever you have a, a production that can be substituted in your own country, then only then the discussion uh, should be uh, uh, well. Uh, do we need to protect uh, the way we produce this product in our uh, country? Um, uh, do, we, do we look at the possibilities of importing uh, products that are the same quality uh, but cheaper? Uh, do we uh, protect our uh, uh, jobs in a, in a certain uh, way? So all the discussion that, that uh, takes place in the international fora where both the United States and Germany are members, the World Trade uh, Organization, WTO, uh, uh, for instance. Um, if you uh, have ever a chance to visit any factory uh, in the Midwest, um, like for instance Detroit, which uh, is now with the name of the plant is only Detroit, it used to be the diesel plant, uh, uh, the Chrysler, Detroit Chrysler diesel plant, now it's only, uh, now it was Detroit diesel. These days, after uh, Detroit had gone into insolvency, uh, the company decided to buy the title or the brand name Detroit from the city. So the plant is called Detroit now. And if you go through Detroit and see the production of uh, diesel engines for the Freightliner, uh, trucks, uh, then you will notice that the, the engine blocks, so the rough part which where the cylinders are then mounted on, 
comes from South Africa. The robots come either from Japan or from Switzerland or Liechtenstein or uh, Germany or Austria. That this or that part has traveled in the NAFTA space between uh, the United States south to Mexico, then north to uh, Canada, and certain things have happened to that part, and then it goes into uh, the part that then becomes uh, the, uh, the, 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 the final uh, uh, diesel engine leaving as a Detroit product this plant. Without these contributions, without the free traffic of goods among the countries that I just named, without the import of machines, which are no longer made in the United States, the person on the assembly line would not have his or her job. They would be out of work. It's impossible to uh, do certain things without being uh, connected globally. And to stress, um, uh, like we've heard lately, um, uh, I think America first is mostly uh, thought in uh, political terms. But in economic terms, I would say it misleads you. Global trade is, as far as, at, at, at least as far as we see it, a uh, uh, mutual win-win uh, situation. Going back to uh, theories of uh, a person of an Englishman and named uh, Adam Smith. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in Germany in particular, uh, we are aware of uh, the fact that uh, we, are, we need to be um, extremely well connected globally. We are benefiting uh, tremendously from globalization, uh, maybe most uh, compared to other uh, countries. We have practically no natural resources, there's no, no notable uh, uh, crude oil, there's no notable uh, uh, gas, neither liquid gas, no. what we have is dirty coal. And whatever one uh, says about coal, coal is about the dirtiest uh, that, you can, uh, that you can get as um, uh, a primary uh, energy uh, uh, resources. In Germany, uh, every second euro uh, is uh, generated to an international business transaction every second uh, euro. Almost one job in four is dependent on exports, and in industry it is even one job in two. Uh, manufacturing uh, still has a share of about 24% uh, of the GDP. Uh, the latest figure for the United States escapes me, but I think it's almost half that size. I think it's in the region of 13 or 14%. Uh, percent. Um, uh, so, um, you, you get and gain different perspectives uh, depending on where you stand in uh, manufacturing. That is certainly uh, true. So, protectionism, anti-protectionism uh, is an issue where we are in um, serious negotiations with the United States at uh, uh, the moment. Another issue where we, uh, uh, where our opinions and views uh, differ are uh, in uh, climate and energy uh, policy. Uh, both are high on the agenda of German politics. At the moment, uh, the uh, successor conference, the Paris Climate Conference is taking place in, in uh, Bonn. Um, uh, our uh, decision stands that by 2022 we will get rid or shut off all nuclear energy plants in uh, uh, Germany. Uh, that is a uh, decision after the Fukushima uh, disaster. Uh, and we have ambitious carbon dioxide reduction goals. There's a lot of internal uh, discussion in Germany whether we actually will be able to meet our goal for 2020. Uh, where we uh, plan to reduce CO2 emissions by uh, 40% in comparison to 1990 levels. Uh, some people, critics of the current German government, say that we will not meet those uh, uh, standards. 
and that is part of the uh, current negotiations uh, between, or the preliminary talks between the parties of a potential uh, government in Germany, and I will come to that in a, uh, in a minute. Uh, climate change is only denied in Germany by a small minority, which is uh, really minuscule. I think 99.9% .9 in that region would believe that climate change is uh, real. So that number is far higher than it is in uh, the United States. And one of the <coughs> parties that are denying that is a party that is new in Parliament, namely the Alternative für Deutschland, the Alternative for Germany, the right-wing uh, populist uh, party. Um, the United States, as you know, has announced they will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords. Maybe they are rethinking, hopefully, uh, at least we think they should stay in because it would be a terrible signal to uh, another member that it was different, uh, another signatory that it was difficult to get on board, namely China. Uh, we uh, remain uh, slightly optimistic after uh, the uh, latest uh, signals uh, from, uh, from Washington. Uh, let me leave it at stressing these two areas of um, of concern in bilateral relations and give you uh, the, the headline after this that Germany is definitely interested in uh, maintaining and uh, strengthening bilateral relations with the United States. For us this uh, relationship is uh, crucial. It has been crucial since uh, World War uh, II. Uh, the Marshall Plan uh, helped to uh, build and uh, rebuild uh, Germany. It has been crucial in unification. Uh, without the support of the Bush administration, we would not have uh, been able to overcome the reluctance, if not the resistance, of some of our European uh, Union uh, members and, uh, and friends. I mean, uh, the then President Daniel Mitterrand uh, used to say that uh, uh, I love uh, Germany so much that I would prefer to see two of them. Uh, uh, but uh, and and when I was in I was London as head of economic uh, affairs when the uh, uh, foreign, the British Foreign Office opened their archives and uh, we, we could see the uh, reports the cables that were sent from the uh, British Embassy in uh, in Bonn at the time to uh, London and the uh, fringe, the margin remarks by Margaret Thatcher, the then Prime Minister of, uh, of Britain. And uh, it is an uh, undisputed historical fact that also uh, Margaret Thatcher was not very fond of Germany being uh, reunited. But here we are 26, uh, 27 years after unification and uh, 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 Juliane, you were quite right in stressing uh, the 9th uh, of uh, November uh, today, uh, uh, 28 years ago, as a uh, historic uh, date because the wall came down on that day. But then uh, the, there are other dates in German history. Uh, we also, with the 9th of October, November, we at least think of uh, Kristallnacht, as you call it in, in the United States or as we prefer to say in Germany, Heißpogromnacht, the persecution of uh, uh, Jews, right? the last uh, signal of uh, uh, the, the Nazis that they were serious with uh, their plans to get uh, Jews out of Germany or um, uh, kill them and uh, 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 Jews who did not understand by then uh, what was um, uh, what they were up against in Germany, um, many of them perished. Uh, uh, you are aware of uh, that part of history like, like, uh, like I am, but today it is a, a fact that Germany uh, is um, recognized by and appreciated by Israel as the second, uh, uh, second best friend after the United States. And today we had a historic event when, uh, um, when German fighter pilots uh, 
in, the, in Israel, in the Negev desert, uh, shared in a joint exercise with uh, the Israeli uh, air forces and were overflying uh, Israel. So that was a very symbolic uh, act, which uh, we, we celebrated two years ago, 50 years of uh, diplomatic relations between Israel and, and Germany, and uh, we have uh, excellent relations uh, uh, these days. So let me come to uh, the, uh, the elections. And then I would like to open the floor for uh, uh, questions and answers, because uh, as you could see on the poster, the, um, the computer has gone to sleep, uh, which is fine. Um, it is a talk with Consul Ge uh, General Herbert Quelle, so I should not be talking all uh, the time. But I'm sure this is interesting uh, to you, and I will give you my brief uh, version because we are still in in a in a sounding uh, phase and there's not much that I can uh, uh, definitely uh, tell you. But what is uh, uh, sure is, and I would like to begin with the good news. Uh, seven weeks ago, almost seven weeks ago, Germany did not, I underline, not elect a right-wing populist government. Angela Merkel with her uh, Christian Democratic Union and her Christian Social Union, the smaller party from Bavaria, became again the strongest faction in the German Bundestag, our parliament, and uh, their color is black. Uh, I will come uh, back to that. Just keep in mind their color is black. Uh, so together, the CDU and the CSU uh, scored 33%. Uh, uh, but a five-year young uh, new populist party with a clear anti-immigrant, anti-Islam, xenophobic, nationalistic and racist platform scored 12.6%. The AFD, the Alternative für Deutschland, will have almost 100 seats in the newly uh, elected and the largest Bundestag ever. Uh, the largest Bundestag because uh, our election system foresees, which is very complicated, foresees uh, an uh, enlargement of the seats in Bundestag uh, de dependent on uh, so-called surplus mandates. And there are almost uh, seven, more than 70 this year, so it's 700 strong uh, parliament, which is the second largest uh, parliament in the world after that of China, which does not make me proud, but it's just an effect of the uh, of the election uh, uh, laws that we that we have. Um, so the AFD has uh, 196 of these uh, 700 some um, seats. The good thing again, uh, the AFD will be isolated in the opposition with no direct influence over the course of government in the next four uh, years. Let me quote Stephen Sokol from the American Council on Germany, who said a couple of weeks ago, and I quote, the AFD's success is a wake-up call for the political establishment, but at least for now, Germany's far-right populist uh, support is lower than in Austria, France, Poland, and even the Netherlands, end of quote. The Social Democrats, uh, their color is red. I was asking myself, why did the Republicans in this country ever end up being the Reds? In Europe, red stands for socialism, communism. I don't see any relationship there. Uh, so the uh, SPD, color red, a proud party with, with uh, origins go back to uh, the end of the uh, 19th century, became the second strongest party, and they had actually been the coalition party with a partner of Angela Merkel in the Grand Coalition, which terminated with uh, this election. The SPD scored 20.5%. Uh, the Greens came in at 8.9%, the uh, Free Democratic Party at 107 and the Linke at 9.2%. Uh, for the first time since 1949, we have seven parties in the Bundestag, and the voter participation 
was 75.9%, uh, very high compared with uh, American uh, standards. The Free Democratic Party, uh, in Germany they are called the Liberals, but you can't translate the Liberalen, but you can't translate that literally because liberal in the United States is almost a dirty word, meaning you're on the left uh, side of the political spectrum. The FDP clearly is not on the left side of the political spectrum. In their uh, policy, they're probably closest of all the parties to the Republican Party in this country. They're a uh, free marketeer, um, anti-regulation, pro-business, uh, very, very strongly. So, uh, free Democrats um, uh, at 107 And the linker, the left, uh, they are the remnants of the Party, Partei des Demokratischen Sozialismus, the party of democratic socialism, uh, the main party in the former German Democratic uh, uh, Republic. Uh, the only possible co coalition uh, that Angela Merkel is now up to uh, negotiating um, is that with the, the FDP, the color is yellow, and the greens, and that color is obvious. <laughs> so black, green, and yellow stands for the flag of Jamaica. And that's why we're talking about the Jamaica coalition. That is, uh, uh, we, uh, we are in preliminary talks, which will end next week on uh, entering into real negotiations on the Jamaica coalition. Germany with its parliamentary democratic system, very different from the American, has always had coalition governments, always, since 1949. And uh, both parties that are now member, potential members, free democrats, have formed coalitions with Christian democrats and with social democrats, and they are proven reliable members of uh, these uh, coalitions. The Greens, are a reliable party, partner. They have been in a government coalition with uh, the uh, Social Democratic Party. So they're proven and no uh, adventurist, uh, exotic, or what have you, uh, unreliable uh, uh, parties. Only that among them, they have lots of ideological differences. And that's the, that's the exciting thing to, to watch and the new thing that for the first time there will be four parties because technically you have to count the CEU, Angela Merkel's party, or Seehofer's Christian Social Union for, from Bavaria, and the Greens and the FDP clearly as four parties of the seven parties. For the first time there will be a coalition as it looks uh, of four uh, parties in Germany. Uh, as chairwoman of the largest faction, Mrs. Merkel, uh, will most likely be re able to return as federal chancellor. That will be her fourth term. She has already uh, served 12 years. We do not have a term limit in uh, Germany. And the way a government is formed for all those who are not experts on uh, uh, German uh, politics here, uh, you form the government out of the majority in the parliament, which also creates a very stable uh, system. If, as long as you have majority in Parliament, uh, you will not uh, uh, withdraw your support for the government because these guys who sit in government are your own guys, and you will. So a, a blockade that you have between an, an executive, uh, Republican or Democrat, Democratic in the United States against um, uh, a House or Hill with the other party in uh, the majority, that type of blockade is impossible in a parliamentary system. And uh, we have had some, uh, uh, some incidents of shifts of loyalty during the legislative period, but in principle, uh, the uh, coalitions which are formed will hold for years, and they will honor uh, the uh, things they have agreed on when they signed the uh, coalition uh, treaty. Um, but um, again, as the 
as, as, uh, as I said, due to the ideological differences, be it on immigration policy, clashes between the Free Democratic Party and the Greens, and the Christian Social Union, on uh, tax policy, on, um, on energy uh, questions, the Greens want to phase out the uh, uh, wanted until the beginning of last week. They, they have just proposed a compromise. Um, they want to get out of the of, uh, um, of uh, uh, CO2 uh, combustion engines by uh, 20, 2030 uh, altogether, which it would be a huge challenge for the very influential German automotive industry. Uh, and there are other issues that maybe will come up in your in your questions. Um, so uh, there's, there's a challenge for. Uh, for Mrs. Merkel, which will demand her best diplomatic um, skills. Uh, on, and I will final, uh, finish with that, uh, or conclude with that. On October 24, that is 30 days after the election, the newly elected Bundestag uh, constituted itself, and the federal president then uh, discharged the former government. At the same time, he asked the federal ministers, uh, your term for that would be the secretaries, uh, to continue in office on an interim basis until the new government is e elected. And uh, hopefully this uh, will happen before Christmas, at least that's the, the goal that Angela Merkel has pronounced, that government uh, by, uh, by Christmas. Yeah, I think I've touched on, I've uh, rearranged my, my uh, talk. I've touched on all the issues I wanted to uh, mention in the introduction. And uh, I would like first to thank you for uh, listening so attentively. And secondly, invite you uh, to uh, ask questions. I'm sure there will be uh, <coughs> questions. And they can be on what I've just spoken to. They can be on... Uh, anything that might interest you about my career, there can be, again, on the harmonica, anything you think of, please, uh, this is a talk with me for the remainder of uh, 20 minutes or so. Thank you. I'm wondering how Germany is celebrating or commemorating the 9th of November this year, maybe last year as well. Uh, well, all the, 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 uh, the different um, uh, events that happen on these, on the, on the same uh, day, are commemorated in a different way. With, uh, there, there is, for instance, uh, normally there is a, uh, uh, a walk or a, a wreath uh, uh, laying, uh, thinking of commemorating the victims of the, uh, uh, the Holocaust uh, and uh, uh, connected with the uh, program night, uh, which is a solemn occasion. And there, is, uh, there are parties also, so also remembering uh, the fall of the war, but they are more informal because uh, that has been replaced by the uh, Day of uh, Unity. Yes. I just have a question. Could, could you? This is a personal question. Uh, is Article 116 of German Basic Law, you know, the immigration article about uh, descendants of people that were denied their um, their uh, citizenship after you know the 30s laws of Hitler? Is that still in place? Yes. It is. Yes. Okay. You mean uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, when there's still the potential to become a German, uh, German citizen again after you've been deprived or uh, after your citizenship has been taken away? Yeah, we've, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, reissues of German citizens to uh, uh, families of survivors of the Holocaust still today, yes. And in that case, would you be allowed to retain your U.S. citizenship, or would you have to give that up? Uh, these days, it is possible to maintain dual uh, 
citizenship okay. right. on both sides, on the German side and on the American side. So it was changed uh, um, uh, about 15 years ago that immigration law you could not, on the basis of German uh, law, uh, retain uh, two. If, if you became national of another country, you had to give up your German nationality. But these days you had to defend, maintain your uh, German nationality. So that's recipro uh, reciprocal, and uh, so yes. And that would be done through the German Council, right? Yes, you can. There, there, y y y if you uh, go to the uh, to the website, there's an uh, info uh, box, and you get preliminary information, and then you uh, can get advice by just uh, getting an email uh, yeah. communication. Thank you so much. I've got a second question. This doesn't relate to that at all. Yeah, if, if um, nobody is complaining, then you can ask the question. Does the German government any, feel any kind of, um, uh, feel that there's any possibility of, of Russian interference in the, in the last German elections? Or do they feel that those elections were, were firm enough and complete that the Russians had nothing to do with it? Thank you for that question. It is not an issue, has not been an issue. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, question, uh, uh, which does not mean that, that uh, it uh, has not happened. I think uh, uh, they, uh, the Russians may have made an attempt, but it's not. Uh, uh, there was certainly no effect, no measure effect on that, and um, um, it, uh, the, the, no. Uh, I recall that uh, uh, Angela Merkel, in one of the talks with, uh, with Putin, um, was it earlier this year or uh, already last year, uh, uh, said to him, taking him to the side, uh, and maybe in these cases, they, I don't know, but maybe in these cases, they, she then uses her Russian, and she would have said, Vladimir, don't uh, mess with our uh, <laughs> elections. But it's, no, the, uh, there are certainly interests uh, of uh, Russia in uh, uh, destabilizing parts of uh, uh, the European Union. Um, I say that openly, that it may not be the, uh, the public view of my government, so I take that on myself personally, but uh, uh, just on my on my, based on my experience as German ambassador to Azerbaijan in Baku for three years, uh, so that is a post-Soviet state, the, the influence of Russia is uh, held there, they don't want to let, uh, let go of the region, and if they see a chance to regain influence in, uh, and I think they are pretty uh, successful, for instance, in Hungary, uh, uh, very, very uh, skeptical of the uh, political course of Prime Minister Orban there. Um, so, um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, maybe we we'll come back to you. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. The lady here, then behind you, and then the gentleman. No. I have a question about uh, the immigration policies with the new uh, alternative party coming in. Are the other parties equally? opposed to that position, or do you think there's a, a spectrum of uh, support or uh, less support for immigration policies? Uh, no, the, the, uh, the, the only thing that, that, that the most uh, reluctant of uh, the parties, which is the CSU of Mr. Seehofer, was is that he wants uh, to fix a cap or a ceiling on immigrants. He has demanded for almost two years now that there should be a cap of 200,000 <coughs> per year. Just compare, compare that to the great United States, you know, and numbers uh, you are taking from, uh, not you, but the <laughs> United States is taking from, uh, from the Middle East. And, uh, there's uh, no that that is certainly an issue. I think we have global we have global migration uh, uh, crisis, refugee crisis. Uh, we've never had uh, so many uh, refugees worldwide. The latest group is Rohingya in 
in Burma, uh, Myanmar, um, the United Nations High Commissioner for, Hum for, for Refugees uh, talks these days about 60, uh, 667 uh, million uh, worldwide displaced. We still have uh, large uh, uh, the, the millions displaced in, from Syria and Iraq. And uh, if you look at Syria, Iraq, Middle East, uh, uh, it is safe to say we would not have that situation if uh, we had not had the Iraq War in 2003. And there is an irony of history that Germany was against the war, did not participate. And we are taking, uh, we have taken 1.6 million refugees in three years and 500,000 Syrians alone now. And uh, the countries that participated in the war, like Poland, say we are a Catholic country, we will not take any Muslim refugee. My question was regarding uh, German and U.S. relations. Um, I know a few years back it uh, was revealed that the U.S. intelligence agencies were wiretapping um, on Morocco and our allies in Germany. Um, I know that's a big thing when it came out um, that the U.S. government was doing that. Um, and it's been, I think, a few years since that's happened. Um, does that still affect how uh, diplomatically Germany, Germany approaches the U.S. as an ally? Has it affected in any way like the mindset or perception? It was a serious issue at the time, and I, uh, from my, uh, I have had occasionally some access to uh, uh, the chancellor, uh, and she was she was angry at uh, whether she was angry personally at President Obama at the time or just uh, the people who, who authorized that. But it's no longer uh, an, an issue. Uh, the um, uh, exchange of information of the uh, of the secret services, I think, is back to the previous uh, uh, level, and it, and it is necessary uh, to have uh, exchange the the uh, danger uh, of international terrorism to uh, all our countries is so high that you cannot uh, uh, lose. Uh, perspective by focusing on issues that happen at the time. Uh, I was wondering how the appointment of a master of the councils like yourself happened. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, in the American uh, service, Foreign Service, State Department, uh, about 80 to 85 percent of the uh, top positions um, Ambassadors mostly. Globally, you're talking roughly 200 uh, uh, people, 80 to 85 percent are political appointees. People who have no previous uh, State Department or Foreign Service knowledge, who are uh, may may come from business or uh, or from think tanks, but affiliated with the party that comes to uh, power in the White House. And uh, uh, you have people among them who have paid a certain sum, one, two, three million uh, in the presidential campaign, and have been on the winning side, and they are being rewarded by an ambassadorship somewhere. This is the American system. It's very similar to an apanage system that existed in, uh, in feudal uh, uh, Europe uh, centuries ago. Uh, in Germany, every, every um, uh, ambassador uh, is, maybe with the exception of a handful globally, is a Korean diplomat. And the same applies to consuls uh, general. So we also do not have a situation like happened, uh, happens almost uh, every time there's a change in the administration that uh, people leave up to the level of uh, almost head of division, leave the State Department because they're being sacked. And you have, I mean, the, the vacancies uh, that you have today, a year after the election, 
uh, in the State Department alone, they go in, in the hundreds. We, we, we've never had such a situation. We don't have a, uh, you are as a civil servant, you are ob obliged to be a loyal servant of the state, no matter what the, what the government is. Uh, and that, uh, there's a huge systemic difference between the United States and, uh, and Germany. Uh, you were first, I think, then you, then gentlemen back there. Thank you. Talking about energy, and I know that Germany is, is a world power in global energy, solar and wind, but if you are, the Germany is going to close the nuclear power plants and wants to reduce CO2 in 15, 20 years. Yeah. Uh, what is it going to do? Is it going to buy gas to other countries or how? What's the problem? Um, I think I stuck that out in my, uh, in my, my draft uh, because I had a number here that uh, already now the uh, um, production of electricity with uh, renewables, uh, wind energy and solar is uh, nationwide at the level of uh, between 30 and 40 percent. So it's already very, very high. And uh, we are optimistic that uh, we can uh, close the gap to 100%, uh, almost 100%. Well, there will be a share of, uh, of gas, uh, but uh, the uh, renewables will make for the major part of the electricity uh, generation in uh, at least, uh, or at, at, at the latest 20 years. And, and we've had situations when uh, we had this, uh, uh, this huge uh, storm a couple of uh, weeks ago where the, the overproduction by uh, the wind, uh, uh, do you call them windmills now? These, uh, these turbines. Turbines, 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 sure. Turbines was, was such that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the electricity system uh, the, net, the grid would have collapsed if we had not uh, exported large scale to our uh, neighbors. Mm -hmm. So we could not we could not uh, consume uh, nationally all the renewable energy that was being produced for this uh, that station. Yes. So, how would you characterize the AFD in terms of uh, age, gender, and regional? Representation. Uh, I must admit that I have not uh, looked uh, at the final uh, analyses on that. Uh, the, the, what I what I saw at pretty early, that was still on a preliminary basis after the election, was that there was no uh, that there was no significant. Uh, difference uh, uh, gender-wise, so uh, men and women equally elected, that there was uh, a larger uh, group relatively in the, um, in the higher age group, so not, not so attractive for uh, people under 30 than for people uh, over uh, 30, and that uh, it was only a well, first, uh, there was an argument that uh, you, you saw a high density in particular in the new lender in eastern Germany. Uh, but that has been, um, that has been slightly uh, modified. There are, have been areas also in the west where they um, scored more than 20% uh, of, uh, of, the, of the votes. But there is uh, overall, one can say the um, attraction of them uh, in in the east is higher, especially in uh, uh, Sachsen-Anhalt, in in Saxony, and in also strong pockets of them in Thuringia. But in Saxony, they became the strongest uh, party. They, uh, uh, they passed the Christian Democratic Union. Mm -hmm. 
who currently have the uh, uh, minister president of, uh, of Saxony. Uh, in a minute, we have we had one, uh, one was gentleman back there. Yeah. Um, so this is a two-part question. One of which is Germany gave America the harmonica and helped create blues. Has blues given anything back to Germany? <laughs> um, and then the second part of that question is, I was just interested personally where your interest in blues came from. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, I, let me start with the second half. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, uh, I got the harmonica, I think when I was 10 or 11, and I, I liked uh, uh, blues that coincided, coincided with, the, with, the, with the 60s. Um, and I first listened to uh, bands like uh, mostly white players, John Mayle and Kent Heat. And I tried to uh, copy some of the uh, of the riffs, and um, so I just I just I just liked it. And uh, uh, yes, uh, the uh, harmonica as a blues instrument has come back to not only to Germany but also to other uh, European countries and enriched our uh, music uh, and and uh, pop culture. And without uh, players who, 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 who developed um, a, a, a playing pattern on the instrument, totally different from what it was designed for, also showed um, players in Germany uh, and other European countries uh, the potential of the instrument, which, as I said earlier, uh, uh, extended the, uh, the, 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 the lifespan and and the longevity of the uh, of the instrument, and you, and then you, sir, and I think you you then we have to. Then we can have more individual. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Great. Okay. okay. So Before two we more. take him to dinner at six thirty. <laughs> two. Two. Uh, uh, you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great! I thought I thought it was like that. Uh, just a quick uh, follow-up question. What about the educational level of the um, Arc uh citizens that are voting? Yeah. Well, Is um, it in the United States I, as well? I, I once, maybe too callously, uh, said, yes, probably they are more uh, uneducated. Uh, I. I, I don't know. I, if, I, if you ask me to speculate, yes, I think you have to, um, uh, have to assume that at least people are not thinking through all the consequences. Because if you, if you have a country as globalized as Germany and benefiting from uh, it, as I explained earlier, and then uh, claiming you need to close the borders, renationalize, that is counterproductive, that endangers your job just as uh, it would endanger the job of anybody in any other country having that same position. So uh, uneducated in the, in the way of not thinking this through. Uh, uneducated or more uneducated also in the way that you cannot deny that we uh, in Germany would not have uh, the economic success of the 50s and the 60s, uh, to le much later, without uh, migrant labor. First, uh, it was easier with Italians, Portuguese, Spanish, Catholic countries. So fine, you know. And then, but then the Turks, uh, the Turks came, and now we have a uh, minority of Turks between three and 3.5 million. The majority of them being Muslims. So. If you take that, the number of Muslims per capita in Germany is far higher than it is in the United States. You have about only 3.5 million Muslims total in the United States. And we have that with a population that is only 83 million instead of 330 some uh, uh, million. So again, there, uh, there, is so much, uh, there are so many examples of how um, uh, all these cultures that have come to Germany have enriched German culture. Um, Germany uh, 
is no longer the Germany that German immigrants after World War II left. Then it was a homo, um, it, it was a, uh, an ethnic homogeneous country. Today, 20% of uh, the people living in Germany have a migration background. 10 million, almost 10 million have a foreign passport of the 80. <coughs> and they may be uh, uh, dual nationals, as uh, some of them may be the Spanish, uh, so if you want the uncomplicated European, uh, uh, but there, there would also be uh, better, many, many others and increasingly uh, uh, refugees. Um, so, um, uh, uh, yes, the, uh, there is a level of, of uh, missing out on uh, the realities that go uh, hand in hand with um, immigration or other aspects uh, that are quite obvious to me uh, with the views that uh, voters of the AFD share. Uh, but I would not call all of them, or the majority of them, uneducated in the classical sense. There, there, there are some uh, who are uh, even highly educated or professionals, uh, uh, there may be doctors among them who just dislike uh, foreigners for whatever reason. Does that pretty much answer the question? Uh -huh. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, my own personal harmonica oh. is Ausdeutschen and so I bought it locally in the 1950s, and it's kind of a tribute to the German marketing skills that it has a picture of John Philip Sousa on it, and it's the United States Marine Man. The United States, uh, but where? Uh, but it's a homer, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So I mean, it, no. The, the the marine band model uh, came to market in 1896. <laughs> I bought mine in the 50s. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, and uh, the the owner. And let me finish with this anecdote for everybody, and then we can go in informal uh, chit chat. Um, Honer was so successful with their market. Honer is the uh, second oldest uh, uh, manufacturer, 1857, they were founded. So uh, the, the oldest still in, in business is Seidel from, from Saxony. Uh, they were founded in 1847, building great, I, I play, I play Seidel harmonicas myself. So um, uh, Honer, until, uh, Almost until today, uh, you could say, I think the 50s, uh, made publicity with claiming that uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, played uh, a modern <laughs> And uh, they put a sentence in his mouth that uh, he, he claimed, and that is, in, I think, in one of the, uh, in the biography by a guy, by Carl Sandburg, uh, that uh, he, he said, well, let, let Douglas retire with, let Douglas have his marching band perform, I will retire with my harmonica. Mm -hmm. um, so I was curious about that and I entered, when I was researching for my book, I entered in an email uh, a conversation with uh, the Lincoln Library in Springfield, Illinois. And they said, ah, oh, thank you for asking this question. Uh, we have for so long been uh, trying to uh, refute this, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this uh, opinion that that is that is uh, that is a fraud that is falsified. In the there, there have ne there have never been any letters by uh, by uh, Lincoln that contain this that has been invented by by the biographer. Uh, Lincoln was totally a musical, <laughs> and, I, I, and I couldn't I couldn't believe that I couldn't believe it, so I wrote back. Well. Uh, that may be the case, but you don't be, have to be musical to get sound of the harmonica. <laughs> it's, it's designed, if you blow into it, you get one chord, if you inhale, you get a second chord. So just by doing the most natural as a human being, exhaling and inhaling, you get two nice sounding tones. No, he never tried, he never touched it. So I put it in my book that it's a file. Lincoln, Lincoln never played, touched the harmonica. The rather uh, American presidents who played uh, the harmonica that is a great book by 
um, uh, Kim Field, uh, uh, an American who wrote on the also wrote on the instrument, where and he has a list of of the presence, and I believe that's that's true. Thank you.